So after uh, I will uh, make uh, a presentation introducing both of you uh, in English. All right. Okay. Good. Yep. Should we turn our cameras off while you do that? So I didn't understand. Sorry. Oops. Right. Shall we turn our cameras off or leave our cameras on while oh, you're on, introducing? On, on. Okay. all the time, right? Okay. So, um, let me, all right, uh -uh. I think the, all right. Uh, boa tarde a todos, eu sou o professor José Ferrari Neto da Universidade Federal da Paraíba, uma satisfação enorme para mim estar presente aqui hoje, moderando né, a apresentação da professora Caroline Rowland, do Max Planck Institute of Psycholinguistics, na Holanda, ok? E com a professora Samantha Duran, é, trabalhando como debatedora, certo? É mais uma iniciativa da Abralim, ok? Em trazer para a comunidade acadêmica a, a essa série de palestras. Certo? E eu espero que essa tarde seja plena né, de conhecimento, troca de ideias para todos aqueles que se dedicam ao estudo da aquisição de linguagem. Certo? Eu passarei a palavra, eu farei uma pequena introdução da, da professora, apresentação, perdão, da professora Roland e da professora Durham, certo? Ah, e depois nós passaremos a, a palestra propriamente dita. Aos que se interessarem em fazer perguntas, Ok, eu peço para que façam via chat, tá? É, eu anotarei aqui e ao final da apresentação eu passo as perguntas para a professora é, para que ela possa é, responder, certo? Vamos fazer então essa, essa dinâmica, ok? Ah, vou fazer a apresentação das professoras aqui em inglês, tá? A palestra será nesse idioma também, eu espero mais uma vez que todos e todas possam curtir, ok? Uh, so, I'm a, a Professor José Ferrari Neto from Federal University of Paraíba, Brazil. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here today um, moderating the, the lecture about language acquisition that will be ministrated by Professor Caroline Rowland from Max Planck Institute of Psycholinguistics in Netherlands, right? Um, we will have together with us during this presentation, uh, the presence of Professor Samantha Duran, all right, from uh, University of Manchester in England. Okay, so Professor Roland, one more time, it's a huge pleasure for all of us uh, have you with us uh, during this afternoon, all right? Uh, I hope everyone can enjoy the, the presentation and that this afternoon uh, could be, can be plenty of knowledge, of sharing experience, discussions about uh, language acquisition and other things. All right, so the microphone is all yours, all right, and you can start your presentation, please. Thank you um, so much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. And also thank you for this amazing lecture series, uh, which has just uh, sort of revolutionized um, the, the linguistics world, I think. I don't know anyone that doesn't know about it. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to start my clock. I'm going to share my screen and my colleagues will tell me that I, whose faces I can see will tell me whether I'm sharing the right screen. I, yes, that's brilliant. Yeah. So thank you um, for that. Okay, so over um, the next uh, 60 minutes, I'm going to give you um, a, a, a talk entitled How to Build a Language Acquisition Device. And so what this talk is about, it's about the question that has, I guess the word is probably obsessed me for the last 20, 25 years, which is how tiny little creatures like this manage to acquire the most complex communication system in the known universe, just a few short years, in just a few short years. And I'm gonna start by outlining what the problem is, how do children acquire language? 
And then for most of the talk, I'm going to go through some examples of the research evidence or some of the research evidence and the insights that these studies have given us into how children might do this, how children might acquire language, uh, before outlining what I think is the most promising approach to solving this problem, the constructivist approach. And I'm going to finish with a plea for more work on understudied languages. Um, I'm very happy to take uh, questions uh, after the talk in the chat, or I think it's over um, the YouTube on the live stream. Ask me anything. Uh, ask me about language development. Uh, ask me about bringing up your own children, about bilingualism, or bringing up bilingual children, about how to become a child language researcher. Ask me anything. As we say in my lab, there are there is no such thing as a stupid question. So, um, but I want to start, as I always start, with some acknowledgements, and I just want to acknowledge some of the people whose research I'm talking about today. You'll realize as I go through that this research isn't all research by me. Actually, it's not studies by me. I cover research by me and my collaborators, but also by my colleagues at the Language Development Department here at MPI, by my colleagues at the Language and Genetics Department here at MPI, and by some of my colleagues at the ESRC Lucid Center, which is um, where Sam uh, Durrant, who's our wonderful discussant, uh, comes from. And the reason that I don't just talk about research by me is that one person or one group cannot solve the problem of language acquisition. It's too complicated. We need multi-methodological, multidisciplinary team science to discover how children learn language. Okay, but let's start with what is the problem? What is the problem of language acquisition? Here on this slide, you can see two circles. Uh, the blue circle is going, we're going to fill it with animals with language. And the yellow circle is we're going to fill that circle with animals without language. What goes in the blue circle is our humans and maybe Neanderthals. We don't know. The animals that go in the other circle are all the other animals, every single other animal species on this planet. So this begs the question, why only us? Why are, the on why are we the only species to have a language, to have developed the ability to communicate with language? And the answer is complicated and I'm not going to go into it today, but it's probably something to do with the fact that learning a language is actually so difficult, it's actually surprising that any animal has evolved or managed to evolve to do it at all. Now, because we as adults find talking so effortless and because babies seem to learn language without lots of effort, so without years of explicit instruction, it's really tempting to assume that learning a language is easy, but anyone who's taken a foreign language class in school, or actually many of you listening to me today who don't have English as a native language, you'll realize that actually it isn't the case. And in fact, it does take babies quite a long time to learn a language. So it takes maybe sort of three or four years to master most of what you need to know about language. And that is because a language or learning a language is quite difficult and involves learning a lot of different complicated tasks. So here's what you have to do in order to learn a language. The first thing you have to do is to learn how to understand and produce all the speech sounds of your language accurately. So speech sounds like p and d and m. And this is the point where if you were a live audience, we would have a little audience participation. So we're going to do that anyway. And we're going to do that with everybody at home or um, uh, uh, in their offices or wherever you are. So what I want you to do is say to yourself it out loud, just say the word bat, bat, B-A-T, bat. And now I want you to say the word pat, p, pat, like a pat on the back. P-A-T. So now I'm going to give you 30 seconds or so to try and explain to yourself or the person next to you what you changed in order to go from pat to bat or from bat to pat. What did you do differently to enable you to produce a p versus a b? Now, I'm assuming that everyone at home is doing this rather than running off to get a cup of tea or something. But... Pat and bat. Oh, 
Okay. So if you haven't finished, you can try later on. Um, but actually, most of you, unless you're a trained linguist who has been taught explicitly in a class what motor movements you've used to produce speech sounds, you will be finding it very difficult to explain exactly what you did. It actually involves a very clever, very precise, very rapid combination of the movements of your vocal cords, your mouth, your lips and your tongue. Just that simple change from p to b involves a very complex, clever, coordinated range of movements. And babies have to learn to do this, not just for p and b, but for all of the sounds of their language. And they have to learn to do this, well, they do learn to do this in the first year of life. So this complicated task needs to be completed in your first 12 months. So as well as learning how to produce and understand the sounds of the language, you need to learn what words mean. And again, this isn't as easy as you might think. For example, here is a mum using a novel word, glorp. And if you think about trying to work out what she is saying, what does the word glorp mean? The problem is uh, this, which is what Quine called the problem of reference. When children hear a word, there are many, many different possible meanings for that word within whatever context the word is used in. And how do you figure out what those meanings might be? So, for example, the word glorp in this context could mean cat, it could mean mouse, it could mean chasing, it could mean grey, it could mean brown, it could be green, it could be grass. Or it could actually not be describing anything in the scene at all. It could be describing something that the scene reminds you of, like, oh, bugger, that reminds me, I forgot to feed the cat. And you need to do this not just for the word glorp, but also for tens of thousands of words in your language. Then once you've learned, or once you've started to learn what words mean, you need to work out how to combine words into meaningful sentences. And again, there's a bit of a theme here. This isn't actually very straightforward because different languages have very different grammatical rules and children have to work out what the rules of their own language are. So for example, what sentence structure do we use to express this event where the dog is biting the leg of the man? Well, in English, you have to use a particular word order. You have to use the English transitive uh, subject verb object or agent action patient word order. You can't just take the participants, the dog and the man and the action bites and present them in any order in the sentence. You have to put the biter first, the dog, and then you have the action, the bit, the action of biting, and then you have the patient at the end, the man. But in German, the meaning is expressed differently not by word order, but by the identity of the determiner that comes before the noun. So in German, the identity of the, in this case, the person uh, doing the biting, the dog, is indicated by the use of der. In German, uh, the identity of the patient or the thing being bitten or the person being bitten is marked by the use of den. So Kind of theoretically in German, you could actually swap the word order around. And as long as you use den man and der Hund, the sentence should actually mean the same thing. Here's another example. Here are the verb inflections that you need to learn the present and the past tense in English. So it's pretty simple. If you want about to talk about something happening now, you add an S to the end of the verb. So she travels. If you want to talk about something happening in the past, you add an ed to the verb. So you say we walked or she walked. It's really, excuse me, it's really not difficult to figure it out. Here are the verb inflections that you have to learn if you want to learn finish. And these are just all the different verb inflections that you need to learn just for the present tense form. So this is just to talk about the things that are happening now. This even isn't even to talk about the things that are happening in the past. For that, you need a whole nother range of another page of tables. So you've learned sounds, you've learned words, you've learned grammar. It's all very difficult, but you've managed it, you've mastered it. Finally, you need to learn how to communicate. And again, this isn't simple because we do not actually say what we mean. When you hear, when somebody, you're listening to somebody speaking, you actually need to interpret their message. You need to figure out what their intended meaning is. So here's an example. When I say I feel like a pizza, I don't actually mean that I feel like I am a pizza. I mean, I feel like eating a pizza. 
And so working out the difference between the literal meaning and the intended meaning of sentences is difficult. It's particularly difficult for children with autism, but also difficult for little, develop, typically developing children. But it's absolutely essential if you are to function in the real world, because these sorts of differences between literal meaning and intended meaning come up in most everyday conversations. Okay, so to learn a language, children have to do quite a lot of complicated things. In fact, language is the most complex communication system in the known universe. And the question that we're interested in is, well, how do children learn to do this? Now, back in the 1950s, uh, famous Noam Chomsky argued that the answer to this question, how do children learn language, was to build a language acquisition device into children's brains. So what did he mean by this? Well, this is what he meant. At the time, Chomsky was arguing against Skinner's famous claim that all that you needed to explain language learning was behaviorist principles of learning. So Chomsky agreed with Skinner in the sense that he thought behaviorist learning principles were important. So he said, as far as acquisition is concerned, it seems clear that reinforcement, casual observation and natural inquisitiveness, coupled with a strong tendency to imitate, are important factors. So he agrees with Skinner on that. But he also argues that we need to build something else into the child's brain. And for Chomsky, this was something that explained the remarkable capacity of the child to generalize, hypothesize, and process information in a variety of very special and apparently highly complex ways. Importantly, these ways are ways that we can't yet describe or begin to understand, at least in the 1950s. And importantly, these may be largely innate or may develop through some sort of learning or through maturation of the nervous system. So this is sort of what was originally conceived of as the lad, as the language acquisition device, this remarkable capacity of the child to generalize, hypothesize and process information in a variety of special and complex ways. Now, later on, of course, Chomsky developed his own ideas of what the language acquisition device might contain. And for Chomsky, he argued that the most important thing in the language acquisition device was universal grammar, a set of universal linguistic principles or linguistic rules that are common to all languages innately represented within the lad in the brain. And Chomsky's theory of universal grammar went through different iterations, but the basic idea is that what's in the lad is these universal linguistic principles or rules. Of course, Chomsky's is only one view. This is not, his is not the only linguistic theory. Well, there have been a lot of theory, linguistic theories over the years, or as I prefer to think of them, different theories about what should be put in the language acquisition device in the child's brain. Um, Chomsky's universal grammar is one of the most famous theories, but it's, of course it's no means the only one. There are lots and lots of arguments in the linguistics literature about what you should put in the language acquisition device. So what I'm going to do is take a different approach. Rather than starting with any particular linguistic theory of what might be in the lad, we're going to explore the research evidence to see what that can reveal about how children acquire language and what might actually be in the language acquisition device. And I'm going to take you through a range of research which is starting to provide us with some insights into how children actually acquire language. To give away the punchline, uh, what I'm going to conclude is that I think the research suggests that the lad, what's in the lad, what's in the language acquisition mechanism in the brain is a toolkit of learning and processing mechanisms, but actually that we need to look just beyond the lad if we really to understand language acquisition. So on this model, what is in the lad is only part of the story, but I will come to that at the end. Okay. So what does the research evidence tell us about what is needed to learn a language? I'm going to cover, uh, I can't cover the full range of research over the last 60 years, so I'm going to focus on a few representative studies that I think are particular revealing of wider insights. And basically I'm going to try and persuade you that language development results from a complex interaction of genes, environment and your current knowledge base. So genes matter, but so does your environment in interaction with your current knowledge base. And I'm also going to try and convince you that 
Although environment matters, children are actually surprisingly robust in the face of environmental variation. We also have evidence that language acquisition starts early and that it's an active and a not passive process. And I'm going to illustrate these insights with five studies from uh, myself and from uh, collaborators and colleagues. So let's start with genes. Well, let's start with the first insight, actually, the insight that language development results from the complex interactions of genes and environment. And this is the first thing that we know, right? Despite how the media sometimes like to portray the nature nurture wars, there isn't a war. The study of language development is not a fight between those who advocate nature, the role of the genes, and those who advocate nurture, the role of our environment. It's actually the study of how the two interact dynamically across development. Our genes provide the programming package for our brains to build our brains, but everything we experience from the food our mothers eat during pregnancy to the enthusiasm of our first teacher, all of these things have a capacity influence on our capacity to learn language. So language results from this complex interaction and genes matter because it's your genes that build your brain. But it's not just individual genes that matter. Instead, the language circuits of the brain are built by a complex interaction of many different genes working together. Okay. So, for example, colleagues at the um, MPI's language and genetics department have recently used uh, whole genome sequencing to sequence the genomes of 20 children with severe childhood apraxia of speech or CAS. This is a very rare developmental disorder, which is characterized by difficulties automatically and accurately putting together speech sounds into words and putting together words into sentences. I'm going to play you a short video of a child with apraxia trying to repeat words. And I just want you to notice the distortions as he speaks. Good job. Bye. Uh. Up. Up. Move. <laughs> Dad. Dad. Home. Uh. Out. 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 So um, what the researchers uh, did from this study is they discovered a set of gene variants that occurred in individuals with a childhood apraxia of speech, but not in the genetic code of healthy, typically developing people. And eight of these candidate genes belonged to a complex network of genes that interact with each other in the developing brain. And several of these had actually been implicated previously in other brain related disorders. So not speech uh, related disorders, but other brain related disorders. In other words, CAS by implication, typically developing speech development is driven by a complex interaction of many different genes working together. So obviously that's sort of the first step um, in genetic analysis. The task now is to study these genes in detail to understand how they impact on the function of brain cells and circuits and why the mutations that we see here cause speech disorders. But that's ongoing research. But what I hope I've showed you here very, very briefly is that genes provide the underlying programming package for building our brains. And we are starting to discover what these genes are and how they work. So genes matter but so does your environment. Everything that we experience in our environment has an influence on our language development. And please remember that the environment is not just the speech signal, it's everything that the child can see, can touch, can hear, can taste, can smell. The environment contains multimodal cues that come together uh, in particular spatial and temporal dimensions, and which provide multiple channels of information that constrain the learning space. So as Gregate says here, infants learn about communication and learn to communicate during ongoing interaction with caregivers in a multi-sensory world. So again, I'm gonna show you a little clip of a video and I want you to watch this and listen to this interaction and consider its potential for learning the word light. Yeah, the light. Oh, that's the light too, yes. Yeah. 
Yes. So think about all the cues that are present in this video to aid learning. The word light occurs twice, um, straight after the child focuses their attention on a light. So we have spatial and temporal contingency. So this allows the child to narrow down the referent of the word. Plus, the word is applied to two different objects, um, both the candles on the table and the light on the ceiling. So this facilitates generalization. It teaches the child that the word doesn't just apply to one object, but actually a sort of category of objects that light up. So it applies to sort of the whole category of lights, not just one object. So these sorts of cues are really important. And importantly, they're really rich in the multimodal environment. They really are uh, brilliant cues for learning a language. But it's not just direct experience that matters. Input does not equal output. It's not input in, output out. The effect of the environment on learning actually depends on the state of your current knowledge base, so what you know at the time of learning. And I want to illustrate this with a study that I did with Gary Jones a few years back. So in this study, we looked at why some children learn language much earlier and much faster than others. And what you can see in this graph is the trajectory of vocabulary acquisition between eight months and 18 months from 189, uh, 1,089 American English learning children. And this is data from the amazing Stanford Word Bank and the links at the top of the slide. Now, um, the, this graph shows the number of words that the children know. So the size of the receptive vocabulary at different ages. And I just want to point you towards the pink line at the top, which shows you that by 18 months of age, the fastest learning children knew more than about 320 words. But the purple line at the bottom shows you how many words the slowest learning children knew. And these children at 18 months knew, well, a fewer than or just over 100 words. So we do get massive individual differences in the speed of vocabulary learning in young children. And these differences are partially driven by differences in the child's input. So put simply, parents that talk a lot with their children tend to have children with faster word learning. But in this modeling work, we showed that differences in the amount of speech that parents address to children, so the input, actually affects learning in different ways across the course of development. And we did this by uh, using a computational model that modeled the effect of input on vocabulary learning. And the model implements a very simple learning mechanism based on a process called chunking. So we give this model real input from real parents. And we assess the effect of the input on the model's learning. And what we found was that different types of input have different effects at different points in development. At the very earliest stages of learning, when the model didn't know very many words, the optimal input was input where there were only a few words, but each word was repeated really quite often. So in other words, early on in the learning process, it's best to model, to produce input, which has a smaller number of words, but the way you repeat each word very often. So the word mummy occurs often, or the word daddy occurs often, etc. So a repetition matters early on. After, but later on in learning, after the model has learned uh, a lot more words, you actually see this change. What starts to happen later on is that the optimal input is actually very diverse input, where lots of different words are used, but not necessarily each word occurring very frequently. So maybe each word occurs like sort of five or six times in the input, rather than lots and lots of repetitions. So early on, the model needs a lot of repetitions to learn a word. Later on, the model doesn't need a lot of repetitions to learn a word. Um, and the reason, and because we also um, showed in this paper that the model's output, so what the model learned, matched quite nicely with what real children were learning. So the relationship between input uh, and uh, in real children the model sort of matched the relationship between the input and real children um, quite well. 
There's a, and it, there's actually a crossover point in learning where before the crossover point input quantity predicts growth and after the crossover point put input diversity predicts the fastest growth. So after this point, it becomes more and more important to use a diverse range of words with your child. And in the model, and we hypothesize in real children, this is because there's a virtuous circle between the words stored in your memory, so what we call your lexicon, and the learning of new words. The more words you have already, the faster you learn new words, because you can base the new word on the useful linguistic information that you have already stored in your memory. In other words, the more you know, the faster you learn. The more words you have stored in your memory, the less often you have to hear a new word in order to learn it. Okay, so genes matter, input matters, and knowledge matters. But actually, the other thing that the, the, the next thing that I wanted to point out was that although the input matters, children are actually surprisingly robust in the face of environmental variation. So although sort of hearing a lot of diverse words is optimal, actually um, the amount that you talk to children might not be as important as some people think. So for example, one of the former researchers in the language development department, Marissa Casillas, who's now at the University of Chicago, she and her collaborators are doing this wonderful study comparing how children learn language in two um, very different areas of the world. Uh, the Mayan uh, communities in Mexico and uh, in the Russell Islanders communities, uh, communities in Papua New Guinea. And what she did is she created this vest for children to wear that you can see on the left hand side of the uh, slide. And it basically contains a very lightweight stereo audio recorder and a wearable photo camera with a fisheye lens, which takes a photo, I can't remember how often, but very often it just sort of takes a photo regularly throughout the day, maybe every minute, I think. And what, she, what you can do is because the children are wearing this um, vest for the whole day, it means that you can use the data from the audio recorder and from the photos to basically track the interactions that the children are having over the whole day. So over the course of say a nine to 11 year, 11 hour long waking day. Our kids put it on in the morning, they wear it all throughout the day and it delivers a lot of data about what they're hearing, about what they're seeing, about who's interacting with them. And Caseas and colleagues are using these recordings to capture a wide range of the interactions that children encounter as they participate in different activities over the course of their day. Um, so, and she's documented, or people have documented very different caregiver styles in the two communities. So in the Mayan community, typically there isn't very much interaction with the children. So for example, uh, typically target child directed speech is limited until children themselves begin to initiate interactions. And when they, ex when they occur, interactional exchanges are often brief or non-verbal and take place within a multi-participant content. So there's often more than one adult um, in the environment interacting with the child. The Russell Islanders are, what, are more sort of what we call child-centric um, in their approach. So um, for example, uh, the quote here is, while the Russell uh, lifestyle is broadly similar to that of the Mayan. So while they have sort of similar lifestyles, um, their orientation to verbal interaction with infants is much more similar to that of middle class North Americans. So just like middle class North Americans do a lot of this intensive face to face verbal interactions using child directed speech, so do the Russell Islanders. So we have two communities that are similar in their lifestyles, um, so subsistence farming communities but very different in their caregiver styles, in their childcare ideologies. And the question here is what effect do these different caregiver styles have on the amount of speech directed at children? And then what effect does this then have on the children's language? And what's interesting is that the different caregiver styles really don't have a very big effect. The graphs here are not super clear, but that doesn't matter too much. The graphs are simply showing the uh, number of uh, the number of minutes per hour, the average number of minutes per hour that contain child-directed speech. 
uh, in Russell Island community and the Mayan community. And what these graphs actually show is that in the Russell Island community, the children hear on average about 3.13 minutes of speech directly addressed to them per hour. And in the Mayan community, the children hear on average 3.63 minutes of speech addressed to them in the hour. This is a lot less than estimated in a previous study using a similar sampling method in North America. So on average in the Burgleson sample here, which you can see at the bottom of the slide, North American children hear on average 11.36 minutes of speech addressed to them every hour. So this is interesting. Um, so the Russell Islanders and the Mayans who have very different ideologies and very different attitudes to childcare but similar lifestyles, they speak about the same amount to children. And this finding suggests that it may be lifestyle, not caregiver ideology that determines how much speech is addressed to children. But the more important question for our purposes is what effect this has on children's language development. What effect does hearing a lot less child-directed speech have on children's language development? And the answer is not very much. At least it has not very much effect on the major language milestones. So despite hearing a lot less child-directed speech than North American children, children in both communities reach developmental milestones at about the same age. So if I just describe these graphs a little bit, on the uh, x-axis along the horizontal, you can see the ages of the children from zero to 36 months of age. On the y-axis going up um, the vertical is the proportion of linguistic vocalizations. And these are divided into non-canonical babbling uh, on the left in red, canonical babbling, which is a kind of babbling we think about when we think of babbling. So ba 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 ma 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 ga 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 ga. That's canonical babbling. And then you can see the proportion of vocalizations that are single words, and the proportion in blue that are multi-word utterances. And what this graph shows is that um, children start doing these different kinds of vocalizations at about the same age in all three communities. So both the Rosa Islanders and the Mayans are reaching language milestones about the same time as Western North um, American children. So you get your first canonical babbling appearing at around about seven months of age. You get your first words appearing about one year of age and you get the first multi-word utterances appearing about 18 months, about one and a half years of age. So the differences in the amount of child-directed speech do not seem to affect the onset of linguistic milestones. So, which means that children seem to be quite robust in their language development, even in the face of very different amounts of language input. Why this is remains to be seen. So Cassius and colleagues suggest um, it may be to do with uh, some children uh, learning or adapting to their environment to become much better at uh, learning from observing others' conversations. Or it could be that um, the, what you get in, in lots of communities is a sort of natural cycle in which there are bursts, short bursts of interactional linguistic input that really help children learn. But we don't know. Okay, so language learning is more robust than you might think. The last, well, the, the talk so far has focused on what happens sort of after children learn to talk, but actually the groundwork is laid before children start talking. Language acquisition really starts very early and emerges from very rich pre-linguistic abilities. And I want to illustrate this with a study on speech segmentation conducted by Tinika Snyders and colleagues. So Tinika was a senior investigator here at the Language Development Department in the Max Planck Institute, but she's now an associate prof assistant professor at Tilburg University. And this was a study on segmentation. What do we mean by segmentation? Well, when we speak, we do not pause between words. There is no acoustic signal that tells you where one word begins and the other word, where one word ends and the other word begins. If I was to pause in my speech, I would sound like this. This is not normal speech. When we talk, we run our words together. 
We do not pause between words, which means that in order to learn a language, an infant has to segment individual words out of a continuous speech stream. Now, infants are super good at this. They can segment words out of continuous speech streams after only a few minutes exposure. And one of the cues that they use to do this is the rhythm and melody of the speech. So they pay attention to the rhythm of language and they pay attention to the stress patterns of language. And they use this to sort of segment, figure out where words begin and end. And Tineke suggested, well, given that infants are using rhythm and stress to, to segment words out of speech, we also might expect infants to be very good at segmenting words out of songs, since songs often have a very clear melody and rhythm and stress patterns. So she set out to test if this was the case. And I'm not going to sing this song, but you can always Google it to hear what Five Little Ducks Went Swimming One Day sounds like. Now this study uses an EEG method, um, which is where you put a, a, an EEG cap on an infant's head and you can use that cap to record the infant's brain waves in response to hearing songs and sentences. So what they did is they used this uh, EEG cap, uh, EEG machine, to test whether 10 month old infants can segment words from realistic children's songs and subsequently recognize those words in continuous speech. So they played infants a series of songs that contained a repeated word uh, and we're in the Netherlands, so this was Dutch and the, the repeated word in the example, um, in, in one of the examples here was Bella. So they played the song where the word Bella occurs over and over, sort of in a nice little rhythm like stress pattern. And then in the test phase, they test whether the child has learned to segment the word out of the song stream. And you do this by comparing event related potentials to the familiar word with novel words. So how does the brain respond to Bella? And how does the brain, brain respond to novel words? And ERPs, event related potentials, basically it's just the term for the measured brain response that is a direct result of a specific input. So of the hearing the word in this case. Now, the results in this study were actually very mixed. They did not find the main effect they were expecting. And I actually use this paper in this talk partially to make the point that is very rare in science that our results completely support our hypotheses. So um, this is not an unusual occurrence and you can read the paper for full details. But I want to point out one important secondary um, finding that they predicted and that they found. What this, the graphs, the three graphs on the right hand side of the slide show are event related potentials averaged over the left frontal electrodes, so here, for both song and speech together, for speech alone and song alone. The red lines show the ERPs, the reaction of the brain to uh, the first repetitions of the target word, so the first time the you hear the target word, so when the word is unfamiliar. And the blue lines show the repetitions to the word, uh, the brain response to the word when it's familiar, when it's already been heard sort of five or six times, six or seven times. And what you can see here is the lines do disassociate. Um, so this suggests that the brains are responding differently to the word Bella depending on the number of times they've been exposed to that word in the song stream, which suggests there is some evidence that they can recognize the word. They've learned to rec recognize and to segment the word out of the continuous song stream well before these children learn to talk. Okay, so language acquisition starts early in life, just a few months after birth. Children are already able to segment words out of the speech stream. But segmentation is a really passive process. And in the last study, I want to illustrate that language learning requires more than just passively absorbing information from the environment. It involves active learning too. And thankfully, children are really active learners. They are capable of manipulating their environment to provide themselves with multiple learning opportunities. So just to illustrate this with another clip, please watch this baby learning all about gravity. What's that? Oh, did you drop it by accident? Oh dear. Can we put it back up here for you to play with? Be careful you don't drop it by accident again.
Oh, whoops! <laughs> Did you drop it by accident? Oh, poor you! Oh dear, poor Flinda, he wants to play with you. I'm glad we didn't drop it again. <laughs> no matter how many times I watch that, it still makes me laugh. So this may well be very annoying for parents, but this is a baby learning to, about gravity. This is a baby manipulating her environment to provide herself with multiple opportunities about the fact that every time you drop something, it will fall to the floor. But actually, this kind of active learning is not restricted to simple repetitive actions like dropping a toy. Young children can be much more sophisticated than that. And in some circumstances, they will actively choose to learn from knowledgeable adults and will ignore adults who provide inconsistent or uh, useless information. So the last study I want to talk about today is from some colleagues at the ESRC Lucid Centre in the UK. And these colleagues recently discovered that even children as young as 12 months of age will actively seek information from knowledgeable adults in situations of uncertainty. So this is a live experiment with live experimenters um, and um, live children. And what happens in this experiment is the child's caregiver puts objects on a table in front of the child and basically says, what is this? And you can see the setup on the right, a schematic of the setup on the right hand side of the slide. So the child care, the caregiver goes, what is this? And in the room are two unfamiliar adults, experimenters. One experimenter always answers the caregivers, what is this question with the correct label. So they'll say, it's a ball. And then during the subsequent interaction, they will repeatedly label the object. Wow, a ball, what a nice ball. I like this ball, where's the ball? <gasps> a ball. And this person is the informant who always reliably labels objects. The other experimenter responds in an equally engaging child-directed way, but makes it clear that they don't know the label. So when the caregiver says, what is this? They'll say, oh, I don't know. And then in the subsequent interaction, they continue to respond, but never labeling. So they say, wow, what's this? Look at this. Mm, this is nice. I like this. And this is the non-informant who is set up in the experiment as somebody ignorant of the object labels. And both experimenters take turns talking to the infant. And then comes the, the key phase, right? The test phase. In the test phase, the child is asked to make an impossible choice. They are asked to locate a novel ob object which is labeled with a novel label. So they're asked to locate where's the Danny? Where's the FIFA? And the two objects on the table are novel. So in other words, there are no cues as to which object is the Danny, right? And the key question here is, who will the infant look at to provide the answer? Will the infant look at the informant, who's reliably provided labels in the past, or will they look randomly at both investigators? And the answer is, the results showed quite conclusively that the infants were more likely to look first at the informant. So when they hear, what is this, they're going to look, they look at the person who's reliably provided labels in the past. Interestingly, they don't do this in the trials in the experiment where uncertainty isn't involved. So, for example, there are some trials where the caregiver presents the novel toys, but doesn't say what is this, doesn't ask for the label. And you don't see the same kind of behavior from the infant. The infant doesn't look at the informant in this case. And it's only when the caregiver says, where's the X? Um, and um, the, the kid doesn't know, the baby doesn't know, and so they look at the reliable informant. In other words, when facing uncertainty, 12 month old infants selected refer to an informant and not the informant. So infants aren't just exploring the physical world like through their actions, like in the case of the gravity example. They're already sensitive to which adults around them are expert, competent informants, and they're selectively choosing to pay attention to those adults in situations of uncertainty. Okay, so to conclude the middle section, uh, the um, language development results from a complex interaction of genes, environment, and your current knowledge base. Genes matter, but so does your environment and interaction with the state of your knowledge base. However, children are surprisingly robust in the face of environmental variation. 
Language acquisition starts early based on rich pre-linguistic communicative and cognitive abilities, and it's an active and not a passive process. Children are capable of manipulating their environments to provide themselves with multiple learning opportunities. So what does this mean about for our understanding of how children actually acquire language? Well, I would suggest that when you consider all the evidence together, it's best explained by a constructivist framework and a constructivist thesis in which language development is, which language is conceptualized as emerging from these rich pre-linguistic communicative cognitive abilities, where language is built by a toolkit of learning and processing mechanisms that dynamically construct it as the child learns and explores her environment, and where learning is shaped sort of moment by moment by interactions between the environmental input and the child's current knowledge base. Within this model, we see the learning process as a sort of conceptual, the virtuous developmental spiral in which the current knowledge base, the learning mechanisms all become much more sophisticated throughout development with advances in one influencing in the advantage of others moment by moment. And for those of you that know something about the history of research in linguistics or the history of research in language acquisition, one of the advantages of this approach is I feel it recognizes the merits of aspects of traditional theories, but refines and extends upon them. So it recognizes that children are born with genetically specified sophisticated learning mechanisms, and that these mechanisms are constrained to pay attention to some regularities more than others. It recognizes that children are not passive receivers of information, contra Skinner, contra behaviorism, but they actively utilize mechanisms for learning. It recognizes that the environment is much more substantial and much more multifaceted than acknowledged by traditional nativist approaches that would often argue for a poverty of the stimulus. And perhaps most crucially, it recognizes that the learning process is constrained at every point in development by the child's current knowledge state and the processing limitations under which they operate. And those things together condition what gets learned. And this means that the effect of the environment might be very different, not just at different ages or different developmental stages, but even perhaps from one day to the next or from one moment to moment, the effect of the environment might have a different effect on the learning process. And it's this sort of perspective of a dynamic developmental cycle that's constantly in flux, that is constantly moving, that I think is missing from traditional theories of how children learn language. Okay. I'm at, oh. If you can still hear me, I have a processing error. I'm just going to try and get it back. Is something Gary wrong with the slides, Professor? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. I've got a processing error. I'm just, I'm going to stop sharing and start again. I'm very close to the end. Um, let me just raise these prices. One, give me one second. Okay. I have a processing error with PowerPoint. So just give me one second. Try and get that back. Okay, I can't get the PowerPoint slides back up. So we're going to wait for those to come back up and I'm just going to continue talking and trying to remember what I wanted to say. Oh, wait, no, hang on a minute. Might be able to end task. Yeah, I've managed to end the task. Okay. Now I'm going to do, I'm not going to use presenter view. 
I am going to reduce the processing demands on my computer and simply show the last few slides not in presenter view. Okay, can you see the slides again? Excellent. Okay, so, so what I just said um, was that uh, I think there's a that I think the research evidence supports this sort of developmental uh, spiral constructivist idea, and within this theory, what is coming back to what Chomsky's language acquisition device coming back to this, what is in the lad according to this theory, is this toolkit of learning and processing mechanisms um, that dynamically constructs the language as the child explores and learns from her environment. But in the abstract, for the very final sort of few minutes, I, um, I want to just uh, address one more issue. So in the abstract of my talk, I said that I would explain not just how we think children learn language, but why languages differ and why they're sometimes surprisingly similar. And I think that the constructivist thesis has a very nice explanation of why languages are shaped the way they are. But Christian, Morton Christensen and Nick Chater have put this a lot better than I ever could in their BBS article in 2008, Language as Shaped by the Brain. And basically they argued that languages are the way they are because they have been acquired by the human brain. They are shaped by the characteristics of the human brain. So language has adapted to be easy to learn, to produce and to understand. The structure of human language is shaped around human learning and processing biases from the processing and learning mechanism. It's shaped by the processing and learning mechanisms in the lad, in the language acquisition device. And these biases derive from the structure of our thought processes, from perceptual motor factors, from cognitive limitations and from pragmatic constraints. So language is easy for us to learn and use, not because our brains embody knowledge of language, but because language has adapted to our brains. Language has found a way through in the same way that bats and birds have found different ways to fly. Different languages have found different ways to evolve to communicate. However, in order to explain why language acquisition is the way it is, why languages are the way they are, and how children acquire all of these different languages. So in order to have a really thorough, complete theory of how children acquire languages, we need to be able to explain and understand how children acquire all, or if not all, most of the world's 7,000 languages. And unfortunately, we only have data on 2% of the world's languages. So what I'm showing you here is a graph from a very recent uh, preprint by Evan Kidd and Rowena Garcia. And they looked at what languages have been studied over the last 70 years. So what languages have been studied and published in child language journals between 1974 and 2020. And although we're getting a little bit better, so although we are studying a wider range of languages now in 2020 than we were in 1974, it's still not brilliant. We still really only know how children acquire a handful of languages. So English, German, Spanish, maybe Dutch, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I'm finishing this talk and I've just got another processing error, so I might not be able to move the slide. But anyway, as long as you can still hear me, that's what matters. I'm finishing the talk on a plea. So those of you who are interested in becoming child language researchers or those of you who, yeah, uh, those of you who are interested in becoming child language researchers or those of you who are um, uh, interested in child language, I would make a heartfelt plea to please study, let us study more languages across more of the world's um, languages and more of the world's cultures. And if PowerPoint will allow me to show my final slide, I'm just going to put up a link to the LangView community, um, which is a group of us who are trying to change this, who are trying to do something um, to uh, increase the number of languages that we study and increase the geographical locations of child language researchers across the world. So if you're interested in joining us, uh, you can email me or you can go to the Langview um, website to find out more. And that's everything I want to say. Thank you very much and for bearing with me in the last um, uh, few minutes where we had a few technical problems.
So thank you for your presentation, uh, Professor Roland. Uh, I ask for you uh, stop sharing uh, the, the screen, please. And, and now uh, I will pass the word for Professor Samantha, right? Uh, Samantha uh, will act as a, a, a person to discuss, right? So Samantha, you, your, the microphone is all yours and everyone uh, is, is so exciting to hear you about the presentation, right? I hope the discussion can be plenty of new knowledge uh, as the same as the, the presentation of Professor Roland, right? You can start your, your, your talk. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Caro. That was um, really interesting. Um, and I think the move towards um, embracing what children are experiencing beyond just the input and bringing the environment and all of those other cues in is something that um, I definitely am interested in doing in my own work. And it's great to see that there are other people out there who are doing that and in encouraging people to think about the wider environment that children are learning language in as well. Um, I do have a few questions that I have thought about during the talk, but just to follow up on your last point really um, about the plea for additional research in other cultures, do you have any recommendations about how people can get interested, get into doing that? What do we need to do? Um, I think there's lots of um, discussions that I've been aware of about making sure that these are culturally done in a culturally sensitive way and making connections with people who are already working within those communities. So do you have any sort of tips as to how people can get started on that process? Yeah, absolutely. The first tip is to join the Langview community because um, it's actually it's designed. Uh, well, it was set up, but it, it, to have um, to sort of bring together researchers from all over the world. So if you um, people on our there are people on our board from all over the world, from Australia, um, uh, from uh, Asia, from Africa, from South America, from North America, from Western Europe, from Eastern Europe. And so if if you sort of join the community, you will meet people who you can work with to do research in other cultures and other languages. There is also a lot of people in the community who have a lot of experience of working in um, communities. And there are tricky moral and ethical issues. And, you know, we're here um, sort of hosted by, amongst others, the Brazilian Linguistic Association. And, and um, and I know that um, what we have to, we as Westerners, right, as white middle class Westerners, rich Westerners have to avoid is what sometimes happened in the past is sort of swooping into communities and collecting data and then swooping out again and not actually giving anything back. So the important thing is to co-create and co-produce um, research with local communities. And the best way to do this is to get hold of local researchers, is to collaborate with local researchers, really talk to the communities, find out what kinds of things they want back. So I know, for example, that um, Evan Kidd, who's been working working in some um, communities in Australia, what they've been doing is, is producing sort of storybooks for children in native language, in, in, in the original languages of the, of the culture. Um, and so these are sort of give it creating, and this is what people ask for, right? Resources that you can use to um, make sure that the children can learn um, these languages as well. So I think there's, there's lots of um, things that we as, you know, Western rich, whatever democratic countries need to think really carefully about before plunging into research uh, on understudied languages, on the 98% of understudied languages, but there are lots of ways to do it properly and the Langview community is a good place to start. I've learned so much just from talking to people in that community, it's incredible. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. I think those are, those are really useful. I know that I'm going to sign up. Um, Excellent. And to, to join convert, convert, convert. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure there are plenty of others out there. Um, so to move to kind of the, the core content of your talk, um, I'm going to push you on uh, some specifics that you might not know the answers to or might not want to necessarily commit to, but um, what might those innate learning mechanisms be? 
do you think they would be general processing mechanisms or are they specific to language? Is there a mixture of both going on? Um, and would you propose that those related constraints within that are developmental um, or are they maturational and driven by kind of age related um, aspects? Okay, yeah. Um, so what are the mechanisms? Um, and what are the constraints? So age, um, learning environment, yeah. Um, so this is the, you know, this is the, the question that has obsessed people, right? Uh, it, in linguistics, right? What is language specific? What is human specific? What is animal general? What is cognition general? I'm gonna say I don't care first. <laughs> Um, and the reason I don't care is if we discover how children learn language, the answer to those questions will fall out of that model. If I can build an AI, eventually I won't be able to ever, you know, maybe in three lifetimes. If I could build an AI that learned language as children learn language, the answers to what mechanisms are human specific, language specific or animal general will fall out of that. So I have to say, first of all, that it's a question that in my research, I bypass because I don't, so I'm not interested. That said, it's a question that everybody wants to ask. Um, and um, I, if you were to push me, I would say that I don't think, if you think about a constructivist thesis where you start off with very sort of basic, maybe even very basic perceptual mechanisms and learning processes that through acquisition develop, become more specialized, become more domain specific. So that become more um, uh, tuned into particular inputs. Then as far as I'm concerned, there isn't great evidence for anything more than just sort of general basic cognitive perceptual abilities. And, um, and, and by these sort of general cognitive perceptual abilities, I mean things like, you know, Spelke's um, uh, sort of basic knowledge of objects. So I have no problem with children uh, being born with abilities. I think there's probably evidence that children are born with abilities that know that, you know, two objects can't go through each other. So basic properties of objects, basic perceptual properties of objects. Um, I can't see a lot of evidence that children are born with very sort of complicated, sophisticated linguistic knowledge, such as the, the kind of knowledge that Chomsky put in UG. Doesn't mean it's not there. It's just that I can't see any evidence for it from newborns. So I think probably we have basic perceptual, cognitive perceptual processes that we start out with that become more sophisticated. That said, there is no such thing as a massive as domain general in the brain in the sense that um, there are parts of the brain that are tuned to auditory input. There are parts of the brain that are tuned to visual input. There are parts of the brain that are tuned to you know, sensory input. And therefore the, uh, the, the brain is always gonna be tailored to specific kinds of input. If we then later build up abstract domain general representations, maybe, but no, the brain, there is domain specificity in perception, how the brain responds to perceptual input from the start. Um, in terms of what are the constraints, whether they're maturational constraints, whether the constraints on the mechanism come with learning, um, I don't think we know. I think there's some really interesting work coming out of developmental neuroscience about the role of myelination about and the amount of, uh, I'm going to say, grey matter, white matter in the brain um, does seem to have a relationship with individual differences in the speed of learning. So maybe that there are, we might actually be able to see structural differences in the brain that predict um, the speed of language learning and maybe cognitive development in general. Um, so yeah, there are, there are going to be maturation constraints. There are gonna be constraints created by the environment, both sitting on the fence answer. <laughs> so relatedly, um, do you think that these mechanisms are time sensitive in terms of age or developmental levels? So, by this, I'm sort of thinking about, are there mechanisms that are implicated in learning at certain points um, that are sort of crucial for learning those early sounds and for segmenting, but maybe aren't used or are replaced by more sophisticated mechanisms as the system develops? I'm thinking about this specifically with, um, as you mentioned actually during the talk, about how hard it is for second language learners as adults to pick up that additional language, but yet these babies are doing it 
and making it look easy. So is it that there are mechanisms that are available and accessible to those really young language learners that as adults have kind of dropped off the radar or are now working at a more sophisticated level that means we can't access those kind of more basic levels that are needed? So I think the answer is um, yes, there are definitely there's definitely something that is available to children that is not available to adults. And she says this from Bishop personal experience trying to learn Dutch in her 40s. Um, so I have found it relatively simple to learn words. Um, I find it hard to retrieve words to produce them, but I, I find it quite easy to learn them in the sense that I my comprehension of words in Dutch is quite good. So I've learned a lot of words, right? I know thousands and thousands and thousands of words, but I will never be able to pronounce the sounds for the word egg an onion because it's impossible because I just came to this impossible to pronounce sound in Dutch um, too late. So, um, so yeah, so you're tuning. So we know that babies tune into the sounds of their language in the first year. So we know that it's, it's harder to learn to reproduce this and actually to hear the sound, the phoneme distinctions, the sound distinctions in your language mm -hmm. later on. So it's really hard to learn that. Vocabulary seems to be relatively spared in the sense that it's almost as easy to learn words as an adult as it is as a child. And I think there are some studies that actually show that adults can learn words in a new language faster sometimes than children. So words seems to be spared. Grammar also seems to be really, really tricky um, to learn as a second language learner. learner. Um, but, but again, we don't know whether the, it's a maturational problem or that your first, the grammar of your first language gets in the way. So I know that, um, so that we, we talk here because everybody's multilingual apart from me about these sort of bizarre um, interaction effects where actually your third and your second language get mixed up and we start using Dutch separable verbs in Mandarin, for example. That's one example. So, so grammar also seems to be something that it's really hard hard to learn as a second language learning as a late language learner. Um, there are amongst others two possible explanations for, for the difficulty of learning language as an adult. Um, one is that you have learning mechanisms that just kind of disappear as you get to adulthood that it's almost mm -hmm. you know it's like um, sort of wither away if you like. So you have these abilities and they just sort of maturationally wither away. Um, another is that um, your first language gets in the way so that the process of learning a second language is just completely different to the process of learning a first language. Um, and another is at a combination of the two so that maybe the knowledge that you have of your first language um, or that the um, that your brain, the knowledge of the first language sort of sets your neurons so that it's harder for them to change the learning pattern. So we know that neurons are the brain is highly plastic in childhood and then it becomes much sort of more rigid in the sense of it's harder to change the neuronal pathways when you're older and that could be a maturation effect or that could be an experience effect. Um, the one thing I would say is that the, the sort of sensitive period for learning language is much broader than people think. So there was a study a few years ago with millions of second language learners on morphosyntax learning and it seemed to be that if you sort of start a second language in your childhood or your teenage years um, that if you give yourself time to learn that language before you become an adult so I don't know you started at 13 right or um, then you can become pretty much bilingual but if you if you if if you need to have to be learning a language as an adult then that becomes a lot harder and I don't know you know it could just be when you're an adult you're working right you have quite a you know it's quite hard to put the time in um to learn the language but it, there's something more than that yeah so if you have children and you can bring them up bilingual bring them up bilingual it's a lot easier uh, my uh sons both in secondary school will be heartened to to know that i've got evidence for them spending more time on their spanish learning yeah <laughs> immerse them in their spanish absolutely yeah. i'll say professor roland told me that's right. <laughs> um, so to shift away from mechanisms, um, and one of the aspects of your talk that I found particularly fascinating based on work that I've done previously is the element about the child-directed speech um, and those differences that were found in the different cultures. Um, so you mentioned that there are benefits of child-directed speech in language acquisition and then present this evidence from Marissa Casillas that 
the difference in the amount of speech in the North American and the Seto and Rosal Island populations um, didn't seem to have any impact on their um, uh, milestones and they reached those at similar ages. So what would you be able to speculate beyond what they speculated in the paper um, as to what that might mean about the broader role of child directed speech in language learning? So are there qualitative differences in the features of the CDS that those two pop those different populations are hearing that might mean that duration um, of child directed speech isn't the right measure for looking at what those benefits are and where those benefits are coming from. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, so that's an important point that it may not be sort of simple amount of speech that of child directed speech that we hear, or it may be that it's an important, um, that the amount of child directed speech is important, but only for some tasks like learning vocabulary. So what Marissa hasn't done is she hasn't looked at, you know, whether the amount of child directed speech predicts how quickly the children learn words. She wasn't able to do that with her data. So it's just looking at the language milestones. Mm -hmm. So it may be that the language milestones are much less susceptible to input differences, but that, um, the uh, other things, so particularly the speed of vocabulary growth is really susceptible. So that's one thing that I think we tended to assume that more child directed speech is good for everything. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, the second thing I would say is I think we've tended to assume that one kind of child directed speech is optimal. And that's the kind of child directed speech that we as middle class Western white mothers use. <laughs> Um, and that's just clearly not the case. I think what's happening is that you, the children, as I said, are very adaptable, are very flexible, and they actively adapt to extract as much information as they possibly can from their environment. So whether that's learning from overheard speech, or whether that's taking advantage of what um, you can see in, in Middy's paper, actually, of these little bursts of high interaction throughout the day. So the, although the average is only three minutes per hour, there's these big bursts of high interaction, which provide really rich learning environments that maybe those are those are really important. Um, so, so the children will sort of adapt to learn a lot at different points. Um, and the other thing I think I think that we need to be aware of is that there's really interesting findings starting to come out that the kinds of um, speech that we think are optimal might actually not be optimal in other circumstances. So um, that, um, so for example, um, we've long thought that uh, parents that use a lot of behavioral directives, who you say, who do a lot of sit down, do this, eat, eat your dinner, um, have slower learning children. But it turns out that that's because behavioral directives are associated, sort of negatively associated with a particular way of parenting in the West. And when you go to communities where a directive style is sort of much more optimal, much more positive, much more warm, much more natural, actually behavioral deck directives, so the proportion of directives that parents use doesn't predict sort of low language levels. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of nuance in this relationship between the input and the output that matters. And sort of my advice is always to interact with your children, have fun, enjoy talking to your children, enjoy learning about who they are. Um, uh, but um, don't worry too much about using particular child's, styles of child directed speech, just enjoy play, spend lots of time with your kids and it will come. Yeah, okay. So that leads really nicely into my next question, um, which is much of the practical advice that's given to parents, clinicians, practitioners is centered around increasing input, talk more to your child. Um, so obviously you have just said that it, this needs to be more nuanced, but what kind of other recommendations might it be useful to give to parents and families, um, making that message maybe more directed to the developmental stages the children are at rather than um, targeted at um, age-related um, suggestions. Would you ag agree that that's a, yeah, a better message? Uh, it, yeah, it's definitely um, a, be a, a better message. It's also a, a much more complicated message. And so I'm not gonna say we should do this because it's a really hard thing to do. Um, so the first thing is that um, 
uh, you can't get parents to do things that they hate long term. So if you really don't like reading with your children, you know, me saying to you read every night with your children when you just don't enjoy it, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be virtuous and do it for a few weeks, but you're not going to do it for the five or six years or seven years or eight years or nine years or 10 years that you're supposed to do. Um, so my feeling is that we should, we need a lot more evidence on how to make our advice fit better into families' lifestyles, into parents' lifestyles, into children's lifestyles. Um, and it's not as simple as, you know, if, if the kid loves football, talk a lot about football. It's not that simple. That's just sort of, it's too hard to do. But I think we need a lot more research on how to really tailor the advice that we give to parents so that they can do it they enjoy doing it so they enjoy talking with their children they enjoy interacting with their children they enjoy learning what their children can do so that they then have this sort of meaningful conversation with the children and I think that's that's a really tricky thing to do it's a tricky thing to do just in you know in monocultural societies right so to just go and do it in in England I mean trying to do the same sort of thing across all the different cultures and trying to make um, the advice that we give suitable for uh, parents who living in very, you know, parents where the family situation is very different or where the cultural situation is very different or the attitudes to childcare are very different. That's, that's a really hard thing to do. But I think we do need to start doing research on that. What is an optimal environment for this child in this environment in this country learning this language and what is an optimal environment for this child in this country and they could be really different optimal environments we just don't know yeah and relatedly from my own kind of um background and what I'm interested in I feel like a lot of the advice we give to parents around language development is about input and what they're saying and actually one of the things that um, I mentioned at the start of the questions was that it's really great to see that that difference um, in terms of your thinking with the environment, the environmental cues and all of those other things, the visual input, the um, emotional input, all of those other factors. So I, I do wonder as well whether this this change in the messaging could also incorporate some of those other factors for those parents that don't particularly enjoy reading but might enjoy sort of more practical activities with their children so yeah. not really a question but more a no, comment it's absolutely right you know if you enjoy chatting with your child on the bus chat with your child on the bus if you enjoy chatting with your child at football chat with your child at football it's it's yeah I think it's um I think yeah it's a more but nuanced messages are hard right mm -hmm. and I have to say that um uh, the uh, so there's campaigns like the Tiny Happy People campaign at the BBC. Tiny Happy People, yeah, um, mm. are, are really effective at getting these messages across about talking with your children. So I'm not saying that the interventions or the, the messages or the advice we have at the moment is wrong. I just feel a little bit more nuance, a little bit more thought about the nuance um, makes them even more effective. Yeah, I would I would agree. Um, I have one final question, and then. Um, Maybe we'll see if there's any questions that have been posed by other people who are watching. Um, so this is quite quite a biggie. Um, what do you think are the implications of the constructivist thesis approach for our understanding of those huge individual differences in language development in the first five years that you mentioned? And what are there any um, sort of potential protective factors that might mitigate against um, a deficit? in one area of the spiral. So a particularly good um, environment or particularly fast processing speeds that maybe can mean that a lower um, quality of input is less detrimental to language learning. Yeah, there absolutely has to be, right? So again, this robustness, this resilience. Um, we were talking in our lab meeting the other day about, you know, what do we think is the basic, you know, what are what are the basic cognitive abilities that might cause individual differences? And I think one of them has to be sort of adaptability and flexibility, and but also um, a sort of um, interest in your environment. So we see, you know, we know that there are different temperaments of children. Some children are much more explorative, some children are much more shy, right? These sorts of things, they're bound to have an effect on how children manipulate their environment and how they're, you know, how they create themselves a stimulating environment. Um, so I think there are there are clearly um, individual differences in the way in which children approach this learning task. I also think that there's there's um, the, 
the the this the, there are two slightly different questions one is what it what predicts variation in the typically developing range, right? So why, you know, what explains why some children are slower than others, but they're all fine. Their language is fine and their language is within the normal range and they catch up and they go to school and they're fine. So that's one issue. And the other issue is what explains why some children have a disorder that a, a, a developmental language disorder so that no matter how much rich input a parent, no matter how hard a parent tries, that child will always fall behind and really need specialist um, help from a speech and language therapist, really need sort of intensive therapy. So those are two different um, issues. I don't know. My, uh, my um, uh, intuition is that when you're looking at these kids in the normal range, yes, you know uh, a, a slightly lower slower learning speed is going to be compensated by a slightly richer environment so all of these things sort of work together I suspect that what happens with developmental language disorder is that either you know one of the systems is too damaged for protective factors to work or maybe you're talking about problems in multiple systems which mean that the, one system can't compensate for the other so we do think um, there are protective factors but I think you need to look distinguish between explaining disorders which is one process and actually it's not just that kids with disorders are at the bottom of the normal range it could well be that there are different factors coming into play that explain variation there does that make yeah. sense yes absolutely um it's very so got skin right everyone has their potential and then you can push the potential up um with the environment so yeah so do you think then that there are processing innate processing differences between children or do you think that wh how which way do you think that the causality might go to push you on something that I probably should know better about I keep looking for them and I haven't found them yet part of the problem is that every time so I mean Sam's pushing on this because um, she worked with me on the language 0 to 5 project which is this massive project looking at individual differences where we followed 90 odd children in the first five years trying to figure out what predicts why they differ in the trajectory of language acquisition and we've been trying to get these studies out and I keep writing these papers and I keep saying well maybe this thing is the innate ability that causes some kids to be faster than others and then I predict and then I find out what you know what predicts the individual differences and it's always the language at an earlier time point so it's not that you so that you know statistic the speed with which you segment input predicts later language right we've got a study that shows that but it doesn't predict language at 18 months as well as language at 12 months does so the the thing that seems to I always come back to knowledge, right? The child's knowledge is a, at the previous time point is a massive predictor on their, on their later language. And then, so then I'm constantly looking for why does an eight month old, one eight month old have different knowledge to another eight month old? Um, and I haven't found the holy grail of these are the innate abilities um, that uh, sort of start the spiral off at different levels so I haven't found those innate abilities yet but we're still looking and actually we have a postdoc advert an advert for postdoctoral researcher out now for somebody to try again to search for see whether we can look for uh, differences in the way in which newborn babies respond or very young babies respond um, to learning tasks that might help explain why they start if they start differently but I haven't found it yet so a, a naught to five project starting before nine months. No, I'm not doing the naught to five project again. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> that cost all of us so much agony and time and effort. It was an amazing project and we all learned a lot, but it was hard work. <laughs> um, so those are all of my questions. Um, I currently can't see whether there are any other questions. Do I need to look for those or will they be read out by... Um, Sorry, I've completely blanked on your name. Um, My name? Yes, sorry. Jose Ferrari. Ah, that, sorry. Will the, any questions that have been posed by anyone who's watching live be read by you, or do I need to look for those somewhere? Uh, we have some questions uh, sent by the attendants, mm -hmm. all right? And I, I have to read it for uh, Professor Caroline Rowland. 
Yeah. But if you if you have more questions, all right, you are free to to ask, all right, because it's a, it's good for everyone here. Well, actually, uh, I, can you, see, I can see some think. of these. I can see some of these questions on my phone, and I think Sam might help me answer some of them. Actually, so I think we're happy for you to read them out. Yeah. Do you prefer uh, uh, respond these questions you know, uh, made by attendants now? Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, you uh, think... prefer that I read it for you? Yes, please. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Good. So let me thank uh, the the presence of Professor Samantha Duhan. Uh, uh, the questions made by her uh, uh, were were very interesting for everyone, especially for me. All right. So uh, I will read the the other questions. Right, but uh, Professor Durant can interrupt yes, and find and make new questions. Uh, yeah, or, or she want. can, when she comes back, she can help me answer them. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, she's, she froze, me, but she'll come back. Sorry. Yeah. Let me read some questions now. Um, uh, the uh, Always Afridi uh, says, hello, Caroline Roland. I'm specializing in linguistics. I'd like to contact you. I'm interested in reading your research paper and articles. How can I stay in touch with you? Yeah, um, you can. Let me just check that. Yeah, so you can email me. Um, uh, at uh, Actually, you can Google Caroline Rowland MPI and you will find me. Or my email address is caroline.rowland at mpi.nl. Or I'm on Twitter as um, at Caro Rowland. So loads of way to get hold of me. Um, and um, yeah, you can email me. I'm happy to talk to people about, um, about the research or about language acquisition careers. Um, all of my um, journal articles, if you're interested in reading papers, articles, they are all on the Max Planck website. So the Max Planck for Psycholinguistics, um, everything that we publish is listed. Actually, everything that everyone in the whole institute publishes is listed on the website. So it's really easy just to go to my profile and find all my publications. I'm not sure I recommend that you read all of them. Um, but yeah, you can pick and choose. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the other question uh, was sent by Katerina Dracolaki. Uh, regarding the Snyder's et al. study, I'm wondering whether entrainment uh, by not measuring RRPs would show that songs are better, easier processed than sentences. Yes, I think would, well, firstly, so entrainment is, for those who don't know, this idea that when we listen to speech, our brains actually entrain or uh, the brain waves adapt to the rhythm of the speech. So as I'm talking to you all now, your brain waves are sort of adapting to the rhythm of my speech. And babies do that too. Babies' brains adapt to the rhythm of speech too. So I think we would expect that brain waves entrain to songs. Um, now, I don't know the answer to this question, whether we would have better or easier processing um, with entrainment, but this is something that Tineke Snyders, who's the, the author of this paper, um, is really, really interested in. And I know, again, I'm going to suggest going to the Max Planck Institute website because Tineke Snyders, um, his email address is on there. And she knows a lot about entrainment as well as about EEG and a lot about rhythm and songs and the effect of rhythm and stress in, in songs on early speech segmentation and song segmentation. So I'm sure she would have a much better answer to that question than me. But yes, I would expect brains to entrain to songs. Whether or not entraining to songs leads to easier segmentation than not, I don't know. But it's a fascinating idea. Thank you. Hi, Sam, you're back. <laughs> Hello, sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. We've all had technical problems. Uh, one more question uh, made by Hailing Hailing How, 
I'm uh, sorry if, if my pronunciation is not correct. Uh, the question says, I have a practical question about doing field language acquisition research. If your lab PI does not have connections to those diverse communities, I feel that it's very hard to really do it. Yeah, I think it's absolutely really hard to do. Um, and this is why I said to Sam earlier, join the Langview community, because the real, the real, one of the main purposes of that is to put people in touch with each other. So put researchers in touch with each other across the world so that um, people who, like me, are based in the Netherlands, can try and develop um, projects which are in interaction with my colleagues in Chile or Brazil or um, and actually study these diverse communities. Um, one of the reasons why, as you saw on the graph that are from Kid and Garcia, one of the if you look at the languages that we know a lot about and you look at where most child language researchers are, they're basically the same place. So we know a lot about Dutch because it's a big child language community in the Netherlands. And we know a lot, we actually know quite a lot about Mandarin and about Cantonese because there are child language researchers there. And we know quite a lot about um, the languages in Singapore because we have an amazing child language researcher there. So we need to somehow overcome this, this point that wherever you get a child language researcher, you get and study of that language. And the Langview community is exactly the way to do it. Make links with other researchers across the world and do this research jointly. And I think that will be the key if we can manage to do it. It's not easy, but I think we need to try. Uh, one more. Uh, raised by La Rui Maestri. Uh, thanks for your talk. Great to see language acquisition with a constructivist view. Do you think that a constructivist framework would fit the development of prosodic recognition production as well? Yeah, so this is where I, I, I acknowledge that I know very little about pros prosodic recognition, about the acquisition of prosody or actually my, my knowledge of phonological acquisition. I've always worked on words and morphosyntax, um, and so I don't know very much. But if a constructivist, if, so the first thing to say is what I've presented is a constructivist framework. It's not a testable theory. And so it's not the case that I can say the framework predicts X, Y, and Z. We now need to build theories within a constructivist framework. So we need to build a theory um, or you know, a computational model or a mathematical model or a verbal theory, but a well-specified one within this constructivist framework of exactly how input and um, in, uh, sort of innate mechanisms and knowledge base work together. But if we're right, right, if the constructivist framework is right, yes, it should be explained, it should be able to explain every aspect of acquisition. And so, yes, I would love for people to think about how to apply a constructivist framework to prosody, the acquisition, or to um, phonological, to, you know, to lots and lots of different areas of language acquisition and see whether a theory within a constructivist framework makes accurate predictions. Yes, please do. But I won't be doing that because I don't know enough about prosody. So uh, the last one uh, made by Catherine Sorney. Do you think there is any scope for the non-linguistic underpinning of language? The cognitive structures spelled argues are innate, could be learned. Yes, so this is the question. So I mentioned sort of briefly in my um, answer to Sam that I, I'm quite convinced by some of the, well, the, the, Spelke has developed these sort of core principles of, um, I guess, children's understanding of physics, of, of objects, of how objects work. Um, and there are people who are, you know, maybe like Katie Toomey, who argue that um, actually these, even things like these core principles of how we perceive the physical world could even be learnt from more basic perceptual principles. Yes, of course, the answer is yes, of course. Um, and that's the exciting question, right? What are the basic, um, how does a newborn perceive, parse the world? Or actually, you know, how does the newborn start out perceiving and parsing the world? What structures are they imposing on the perceptual world? Um, so, uh, or are they learning, you know, how to 
structure the perceptual world, how to structure what they're seeing, what they're hearing. Um, and we don't know the answer to that um, question. And this isn't something that's specified by a constructivist thesis. So actually, um, I have some great colleagues that I work with within a kind of constructivist framework, and they would disagree strongly with me about what is the basic innate abilities and a lot of people maybe like katie would argue that we're really just born with very very basic perceptual constraints i as i say i'm on the fence um they could yeah everything could be very very basic at the beginning or everything could be a little bit more sophisticated yeah i don't know that's a very bad answer but i don't know but let's test it uh to finish uh many many people in attendance uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, people like Marta, Claudio, Nisi, Tanner, Roner, Marinaldo, um, Steve Smith, um, Constantina Zakaraki, Iris Van Roij, Delay Cara Doller, and Esther, right? Everyone, and thank you, uh, Professor Caroline, for our presentation. And now we have two more questions, right? Uh, the first, if you want to respond uh, to answer it, uh, I can read it for you. Two more questions. Any problem? Yes, no problem at all. Please read it. I'm just yeah. trying to read. I'm reading it as you're reading it, which means things, things keep coming <laughs> right. on and off. Uh, the first one uh, made by JJM Spiral. No, JJM. Spiral model proposed development built on the cognitive attitude and knowledge base, but does not mention basic motor sensory abilities. Do you think language development happens detached from such feats? Yeah, really good question. No is the answer. It has to be grounded in basic perceptual and motor abilities because that is where all the information is coming from. It's coming from the perception of the world and it's coming from the response to the world of your own actions upon the world. So language has to be based on basic motor sensory abilities. The question is, which a lot of people have argued, is, is there... Once you start building these representations, right, the cognitive representations in the brain, the language knowledge, the linguistic representations, once you build those, are they also divorced from the perceptual world or are they still tied to the perceptual input? So do I have a cognitive representation of dog that is completely divorced from all of the perceptual input that helped me build that concept of dog? So does language become divorced from the senses? Do we develop abstract, domain general concepts, representations? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know how you would sort of test it empirically. Maybe somebody else knows, but we definitely, in the sense that we definitely have sort of um, amodal senses in the sense that I can, uh, I can, I can, Im I guess, I think we have amodal a modal concepts in the sense that I can develop concepts that are not tied to the perceptual word. So I'm thinking like I can develop concepts like truth or justice or things that sort of are not perceptual. So clearly I have some way of, of representing abstract concepts, but whether they're completely divorced from the perceptual world, totally abstract, I don't know. It's a very, very philosophical question. Maybe not one, I'm an empirical researcher. So I don't have the answer to that, but it's a really good question. Uh, indeed, uh, I think I thought that we have one more question, but uh, uh, Stella Maria uh, are just thanking you for the presentation, all right? And uh, JJM complete the, the, her, his question saying, um, or, no, she, he erased it, the message. I think so, but it was, right? it was a, it, I think, it, I think <laughs> so, it was just something, yeah. It was just expanding on the, on the question, yeah. All right. So uh, I think we finished uh, this presentation. Uh, Professor Caroline Rowland, I, I would like to say that it was a pleasure for me um, to okay. receive you here. I hope you visit Brazil one day, yes, all right? And now... Uh, due to the end of pandemic, 
uh, it's possible uh, to invite you for a, 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 a visit in here in Paraíba, all right, in UFPB, my university. And I hope any other universities spread on Brazil invite you for new presentations, uh, research, um, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, yeah. researching together some, some points, some issues uh, about language acquisition, all right? Yeah. Here Absolutely. in Brazil, there are many people dedicated uh, on this field, all right? So uh, you and, and Professor Samantha are always welcome, all Thank right? You. So I will uh, look for your email, all right? And in the first opportunity, I will invite you to visit here, right? To a special talk to my students, all right? That would be lovely. Thank you so much. I would enjoy that very much. All right. Now I'm speaking in Portuguese to finish, all right? Uh, eu agradeço a todos pela presença. Agradeço também a iniciativa da diretoria da Abralim em viabilizar a presença de ilustres pesquisadores e pesquisadoras internacionais que contribuem muito para o desenvolvimento da pesquisa científica em nosso país, especialmente no momento difícil pela qual a, a, a nossa produção de conhecimento científico passa. Então, iniciativas nesse sentido são sempre bem-vindas. tá? E, mais uma vez, eu externo aqui o meu agradecimento e também né, o, o, a honra né, e o prazer de poder moderar é, essa mesa. Certo? Então, agradeço a todos. Uh, thank for everyone in attendance. All right? Uh, I will finish this presentation giving bye to Professor Roland and to Professor Durham. All right? Bye, professors. All right? Thank bye, you. Thank you so much. It was great fun. <laughs> yeah. Really enjoyed it. For everyone. <laughs>